Pam to meet me, and I'm the district administrator with the Creature Change Soil and Water Conservation District. And we're serving as a fiscal agent and the technical support. This is a citizen led project, uh, Radio Lake, uh, Lake Tarpy Owners Association. Jeff Harvey has been, um, Jeff and Eric Johnson have been kind of lead in Georgia. So uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to partner with them. So I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna look at, and as you can see, our partnership across the, the bottom there. We also really appreciate the collaborative support we've received from the DNR and Voyagers National Park. Steve Wendells and uh, Phil Talmadge are here as well. And, and uh, counties right there with us uh, as a main partner on the grant and technical citizen here from the county. So um, this is kind of our outline. Jeff's gonna kick it off with how did we get here? What are we doing and how did we get here? I'll go into this, the quick timeline of what the tasks are uh, from a project perspective. And then Trent's gonna round it out with the road project and explain what, why, when, where, how, all of those details. And then we're gonna open it up for questions that maybe we didn't cover uh, in the presentation. So Jeff, you go ahead and pick it up. And if you wanna follow along on your sheet, the yeah. screen will match yours. Okay, very good, thank you. So anyone remember uh, Northern Air back in the day? What the waters looked like on the north side of Northern Air? You don't see that many cattails there, do you? What you do see is County Road 135 taken off across right there. And that's fairly recently built. This picture's from around 1960. So what's this? These are Canadians in Commissioner's Bay pushing a three acre bog. It's the second time they've pushed that bog. I believe that bog made its way to Stop Island where the uh, citizens pushed it into Jackfish Bay. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Jackfish Bay residents pushed it back out again. It ended up by grindstone and then I lost track of it. Uh, so I, I think it's in Zane Bay right now. Zane Bay. <laughs> Seen it. Oh my God. <laughs> There's 230,000 species of plants on the planet, um, but we know about cattails because they force themselves in our, in our consciousness. So the next page, this is an aerial photograph from 2014, near the flood. Uh, this is Grassy Portage Bay in Canada. My cabin is right over here. Went around the corner with Larry Lennox and Mike Valentine. We got around the S-curve and it was very disorienting. Where's the end of the bay? It should have been another mile and a half beyond. That it was a nine acre floating mat of cattails, completely occluding the, the passageway. And you can see where it came from. You can see it came from there. That was the queen mother of all mats that I, I've ever seen. So the thing about these floating cattail mats, the, the hybrid cattails that make up these mats have much more negative impacts on the environment than uh, their effect on human and human navigation and recreation. We applied for a CPL grant. We didn't get the grant because we said we don't like cattails out our window or we don't like running into them uh, when we uh, ride our boats. Uh, we got it because uh, these cattails are bad for uh, habitat for fish and wildlife, and we'll get into that. So to summarize a whole lot of history, the science on cattails says that over recent decades, the distribution and abundance of cattails in North America has increased as a result of human disturbances to natural water cycles, and nutrient modes. And let me elaborate on what that means. First, human disturbance. They put roads connecting islands. 134 connects to an island, 135 connects to an island, 33 connects to an island, uh, 94 has, you know, connected islands. And they just cheat, they just took away what used to be waterways. And what did that do? It trapped nutrients from the inadequate sewer systems that we had for decades. Just trapped all that in there. It sheltered the enclosed waters from uh, wave action, current, and boat traffic. 
and created extensive artificial shoreline for cattails to take root. So <clears throat> changes in hydrology and nutrients are the main human causes of accelerated hybrid cattail growth, but you had to have a cattail to begin with. It's the aggressive nature of hybrid cattails uh, that combines with nutrients and changes in hydrology to create the problem that we have to this extent. Uh, the native cattail met up with the uh, European cattail in the mid-late 1880s. They had uh, babies, they, they cross-pollinated, and the first generation is called the hybrid. So when I talk about hybrids, I'm talking about the cross between the invasive from Europe and the native cattail it produces a hybrid, and uh, the hybrids are a kind of a super plant. It took from the 1800s till about 1980 for the cattails to reach this area in full force. How do we know they're hybrids and not natives? Or how do we know they're hybrids and not invasives? Uh, Steve Windles and others did genetic marker testing on cattails in Cranberry and in Captogama. And if I read the, your paper correctly, it's 98, 99% hybrid cattails. That's what they are. Hybrid vigor uh, is what you might think. Hybrids are tougher than either parent. They outcompete their native and invasive parents. They displace other native vegetation, such as wild rice, sedges, bulrush, and lily pads, which are a better habitat for fish and wildlife. They can grow in deeper water, up to one and a half meters. They grow taller, more densely. They grow extremely fast, mainly by spreading out from the roots. They create a large amount of litter from year after year growing. And that litter inhibits other plants from taking root and results in a monoculture, a pure stand uh, of, uh, of cattails, hybrid cattails. And that lack of diversity is not good for wildlife, fish or wildlife. The negative effects of these hybrid cattails include poor, poor fish spawning. Underneath that dense floating mat, no, no light penetrates. There's no oxygen under there. It's not, it's like a desert. It's not good uh, spawning ground. Fish don't want to hang out in there. Uh, it's poor predator fish don't want to stay in there. It's too, at least in the rooted, when the cattails are still rooted, uh, there's low oxygen. It's too dense to hunt. It's poor waterfall habitat because it can't, when, when the cattails are just taking over an area and they're rooted, and the birds can swim in between, that's fine. But once they keep growing out into deeper water, at some point, because there's air in the stocks, and they have these interlocking, extensive roots, rhizomes that grow, uh, higher water can cause that the leading edge to pop up off the bottom. And then it continues growing as a floating mat. So it's rooted, floating. That floating mat is so dense, nothing can swim in it. Uh, so it's poor waterfowl habitat. It displaces native plants, which are superior food and habitat for the creatures around, with the exception of blackbirds that <clears throat> seem to like invasive cattails just fine. <laughs> So this, I believe, is uh, an on-the-ground look from 135 sort of to the northwest. You can see that the, the open water there is a dredged channel. This is an aerial photograph from 1971. You'll note uh, there's really no evidence in that of extensive cattails except for in this this area just to the east of 133, that shallow and has been terrestrialized. That's been taken over by all kinds of plants. Uh, but otherwise, northern air and 135 and 134. 
people say that people water ski in there before those roads went in. The cattails have not really arrived in full force yet. But 20 years later, 1991, if you look at all those places, uh, you know, that's Lord's Island. It's not an island, it's a peninsula now. The road connecting it, either side filled up with cattails. Cattails on both sides are 134, 135. The only openings are dredged channels. So 20 years, actually less than 20 years to do that. The first effort to try to uh, reverse this, this uh, uh, sort of intrusion into the waterway of these roads. Thanks, Steve. This is a map that was created by Tom Karsnia. So Tom Karsnia deserves credit for really coming up with a plan to try to restore some of the water flow that was taken away when people just built roads, built islands. Uh, and he had a rather grand design. He and others like Lee Grimm and, and people that lived in that area, his plan was to put the culvert that is presently uh, right by Northern Air. That was put in in 2007, but he also planned to put openings in 134, not he, that group, uh, 134, 135, and an opening in the west end of Jackfish Bay, creating an outlet for water into Elks Bay. That was the whole shebang. So what happened in 2007, you can go to the next page, is they did one part of that. 2004, before the, that, the um, culvert was placed, it was 11 by, I think it was 11 by 12, 11 by 12 culvert placed in 94, just to the west oh, of. Oh, no, I thought you were talking about the uh, 2007 box culvert. Yeah, I am talking about <coughs> So it was it 11 by 12? 11 by 12. Yeah, so in that 11 by 12. Before they put that in, this is what the, the area looked like. So that's a before picture, 2004. So I want you to pay attention uh, on the next page to this, this area right here. Okay, so let's go to 2007. Okay, 2007, you can see, if you've got good vision, you can see that channel that leads up to 94, where they put the box culvert in. So let's see what happened after that. Here's a, on the ground, that's the channel being dredged, so the water could get up to the culvert. It's a 12 foot wide channel. And you can see on the, after the culvert was placed, water flows through that, so it's working. Next page. So let's follow over time what just restoring water flow did. 2008, not much change. It's just the channel and all the cattails. Fast forward to 2013, you can see a little rattiness down here. If you went back and forth, you'd see that it's beginning to break away. And I think, I think those cattails ended up on my, on my dog <laughs> on the beach, pretty sure. Pretty sure. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah, it's it's right. just, yeah. So just a bag there, Jeff. Yep. Yeah. And you can also see it got a little ratty in there. So that flow through here uh, undermines some of that. I bet you those ended up at my house too. Sending <laughs> all the cattails to your house. I feel blessed, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> so two years after that, remember we had a flood in 2014. That flood combined with the fact that water could flow through there and undermine and, and uh, it, it must have broken off a lot of mats right there because that, all that area was, it was all the way across with cattails. Now it's a triangle and that looks like the shoreline from 1971. So we were pretty happy with that. I hope so. 2019, it hasn't grown back in. So having current go through there and boats go through there, uh, we haven't lost any ground. Cattails are still gone. So what did we learn from that? 
Well, this became the model for our, our grant application. We learned that uh, just putting that culvert in, restoring water flow, resulted in the regression of cattails on either side of the culvert, especially along the dredged channel. However, because nobody took out the cattails, uh, we were rained upon by floating mats. So it is our belief that habitat improvement is best achieved through water flow restoration and cattail removal, and that sets the stage for planting of native vegetation um, and better habitat for fish and wildlife. And I believe this is the last slide for me. This is, uh, the project is a continuation of the original vision of Tom Karsnia and other local residents in the early 2000s uh, to restore water flow to 134 and 135. And uh, the project is modeled on the success of the 12-foot box culvert placed in County Road 94. I want to say that uh, this was a collaborative effort. Uh, we had a lot of help from the park in terms of methods, Steve Wendell's, Jerry Plum, uh, no, Jerry Warmbold and uh, Reed Plum were very helpful. Bob DeGross wrote us a letter of support. The DNR uh, was a necessary partner and was also um, helpful in signing off on it and giving us some guidance. And uh, the fire department agreed to do a burn. The weather conspired against us. Soil and Water has been a great partner, hardworking, did it so much in engineering. You just can't, you can't do, you have to work together with people to get things done. And so it's going to happen this summer. Pam, I think. Yeah, and the last slide for you was just showing the current project. Yeah, that's nine acres. So, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. So my little couple slides is really just focused on um, where we fit into the project and then a timeline of what the, the three phases are. So um, the Kujiching Soil and Water will serve as the fiscal agent or the grant recipient, will oversee fund uh, in and funds out, pay those bills and then uh, do the reimbursement requests. Um, we will be, we have, providing technical support, we will again, I am currently uh, in a staff turnover, so um, I'm looking to replace that, so I'm gonna be doing the best I can uh, in the interim, but I do have two other technical staff in my office, and I know that my water resource specialist, Sam Soderman, um, was uh, familiar with this and has worked with us on this, so um, I do have backup, um, but mainly it will be most of the the, uh, the next phases will um, be done outsourced. So, but we want to be able to provide that um, that additional support from our office, funded through um, that three eighths percent of your taxes that went up here about ten years ago, maybe, um, maybe not quite ten, uh, when the tax went from uh, 6.875 to or from 6.5 to 6.875, that is what feeds that fund that is um, paying for this, the legacy grant. Yep, exactly. So phase one uh, is our cattail removal. Uh, the purpose is to remove the trapped nutrients, which you know obviously encourage hybrid cattail growth. We want to prevent uh, floating mats and clear the way for restoring native habitat. The timeline for cattail removal, uh, originally, as the letters indicated that you received, we were uh, to do, the fire department was going to do a, a controlled burn above ice to reduce the biomass, uh, reduce trucking costs, uh, but the snow uh, depth uh, just kept coming uh, and we weren't able to see it clear it while the ice was still um, safe. I don't, and I have not checked with Adam today, but I'm feeling doubtful that that is going to take place. I did build a buffer into my budget uh, so that if, because we couldn't uh, do that portion, uh, if that increased some of our trucking costs, uh, I think we're still going to be good. Highway. 
Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. ah, I don't have to call Adam. There's no, no ice left there. No, there's no ice. <laughs> Thank you for checking. Thank you for checking, Jeff. Uh, so the next, uh, the next portion of the removal then would be uh, probably uh, right around the end of the beginning of July through September. Um, we have contracted with Lakes Aquatic Weed Removal out of uh, the Cook area. It's the same contractor that has been working on Voyagers National Park uh, cattail removal process. It's a very specialized type of work, uh, specialized equipment, um, and but we did put it out for bids and that was the only one that we received, and probably because it's highly specialized for that specific type of removal. Um, that contract has been signed and um, so we're good to go uh, and waiting for uh, optimal water levels and conditions for him to start. Um, that will be mechanically removing those um, roughly nine acres um, and then hauling to an approved upland site that we have um, just about a couple miles away from. Um, is there any chance for a burn still or is that completely out? Well, Jeff tells me there's no ice left there's on no the ice uh, ice so, so yeah, I think that out. one's out, which is, okay. um, which then again kind of I don't of think you get a permit to do a burn anyway. Not, yeah. this time of year. Not this time of year, no. Will this, will this removal that you're speaking of, will that be to pull them or will that be to cut them under the water level? It will be to cut. They, they, I don't believe, well, you know what, I shouldn't say that. Um, and that's a good, you, you, you know. If you don't mind, I, okay. Uh, the machine is called the swamp level, and it, it's a boat with a cutting blades that macerates this much underwater macerates the floating mat, just makes makes the, the little floating mats out of the floating cattails. Or if they're rooted, yeah. it cuts them below the water line. Cuts them below the water line. Which doesn't cut. And if you cut a growing cattail below the water line, it floods the root and kills that stock. What what say that in the last sentence you said was the, it, the it floods the root. It kills the root. So if you cut okay. a cattail below the water line, so. It'll eradicate it. It'll eradicate kill that. What? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So that's good information. To Jeff, do you know like once this process starts, do they have like floating booms, or how how do you maintain or control the uh, sediment and nutrients that are bound to be stirred up? And, and excellent kind of question. That? That's excellent question. question. The, the Swamp Devil is accompanied by a harvester barge. It's another boat that gathers up as much of that as can't get 100%, but it gets the lion's share of all that debris, and it'll, it'll, they will stage it on shore, on the northwest shore of the area, and the northeast shore of the road, I should say. And uh, from there, it will be trucked off to uh, private property about two miles away. Is there anything in the water that kind of will help mitigate the sediment that's bound to be like stirred up? And I don't think, at least for me personally, that one project will really affect me, but I mean the water is going to have some increased turbidity and things, right? So, for you can just going to let that some of that, right? Um, you know, they're, they're cutting above the um, the bottom. They're not dredging. They're cutting okay. the floating mat or the tops of the stock. Uh, but in the case where you're getting into the limits of where the boat can go, it's getting pretty close to that. It probably does stir up a bit, but we're putting the um, we're putting the uh, get, getting rid of the cattails before we're putting in the culverts. So some of that stuff is going to be more or less trapped in there uh, and have a chance to settle out a little bit before the water turn uh, before the water flow is restored. Okay. Answers your question. And, and any, that was you understand as well? You're going to do the <laughs> culverts not going to be happening. Culverts are going to happen after the cattails are removed. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Uh, and I, 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 I don't anticipate. I don't anticipate that a lot of, I guess, sediment will be exported from that uh, from that day in the process of grinding it up. I think a lot of it's just going to sit in there and go down to the bottom. Most of the most of the debris will end up in the 
in the harvester barge onshore trucked away. But some of the little bits are not going to end up in the boat. They're going to end up in the water. Oh, for sure. Yeah. At some point, they're going to sink. Uh, I asked Steve Wendells about this. He said, uh, in, 20, in 20 or so uh, cuttings that they've done in the park, they've never had an algae bloom, bloom which was what one resident had worried about, that would create an algae bloom from. What's the timing of this cut? It'll be between July's. When the, the, yeah, the water has to come up to float the boat, if, if it's too low, it's, you just can't do it. If it's too high, like a flood, uh, then your uh, your rooted cattails are all underwater. You can't get out. The last year was in the boat, even if we had planned to six feet. Well, that's kind of my point. The kind of your question too would be that in July or August, you know, the water levels are generally lower. Those aren't going to be months anyway. So in theory, a lot more would just settle out right there where it happens. Hopefully there's enough water coming in to raise the, the lake level to a more optimal. It's a little low to do it right now. But oh, we yeah. all expect the water to come up. Oh, yeah. yeah. Jim, one more quick yeah. question. Sorry to interrupt you again. Um, so you're primarily going to be removing floating mats and or uh, other uh, areas so where the boat can at least float, right? But you're not necessarily going up to the edge of the shore to uh, like remove it completely. That's not the goal, right? <laughs> the ideal goal is to remove all of them. Practically speaking, you can't. Okay. But if a few cattails are remaining yeah. and are sort of in balance again, because cattails have always been here, but the native ones have been, if they're not you know, a monoculture, if they're mixed in with other plants, they, they're probably aren't hurting anything, they're even helping if they're in some kind of balance with native vegetation. And I think it'll be easier to maintain to once they're you know, cut back to a manageable, then it's it, it'll just be easier to maintain, you know, in front of properties than what we're doing with nine acres yeah, in one shot. So. I would like to propose and I'm glad this is still Tom Thomas from the DMR. Uh, I'm glad he's here because I don't want to miss speak. I would like to ask homeowners to sort of be partners in this project to help maintain the longevity of it. We don't want to have to try to raise money to redo it in 10, 12 years. Uh, I'm reassured by Steve Windows that if you take out a majority of the cattails, it's a long time before they would grow back in. Uh, but if, if you, as a homeowner, see on your property that they're coming back, and before they get out of hand, you can contact the DNR and see about getting a permit to have them removed. Did I speak correctly? Yeah, you mean, yeah. So kind of one of the one of the one of the ways that we get behind a project like this is the fact that there's, there's, there's I like to think that it, not only what Steve said it'll be a long time before they ever come back. I like to think that restoring some of this flow will minimize it because Hybrid cattails are, they don't do as well in, in, in flowing waters actually as, as the, the native ones do. So I like to think that you won't have to apply for a permit to clear your property. Like, this might be a long term fix. That's my, that's what, that's what my personal goal in it is, is that we don't ever see, I don't ever hear from any of you about being <laughs> a deep, uh, aquatic plant. I'm not the one that deals with, puts those out, but I mean, I, I, get, I get involved in it to some degree. I do think that there's the potential here with this restored flow to actually have some long-term staying power, if you will. The, <coughs> just the, where we live, is, which is by the culvert, I mean, yeah. before, we've seen a massive breakdown of that mat there, yeah. and the little bogs floating around. We kicked out several of them from that area, but I haven't seen any of them go back. Just with the water flow restored. Yeah. Let, let me ask you this. In your area that you, you live in the same spot, you live in the 135 area, during the flood, the rooted cattails would be underwater. The floating ones would float. Can, can you estimate what percent of that area was that used to have cattails was 
cat tails running in the water, and how many were floating? Uh, I would say the majority of them were underwater. The majority of them? But underwater. there was some high, high areas out in the middle, kind of the little islands. Most of them were underwater. But I would say 90%. It looked like a lake. The majority of them were underwater because the boats and everybody was running through there to where, yeah. you know, low water was just a mass. Yeah, people were using that. So there were that. boats driving over the dock. That could mass. pose a problem for us, though. That indicates that it's pretty shallow there if they're rooted and not floating. And if they're too shallow, the, the boat might have a hard time. You need the water to come up a little bit. I think they're right. Yeah. But a lot of them didn't break off and go away and you can come back off. But I bet they are. Great questions, um, and anytime this is kind of an informal setting here. Um, phase two, um, and I'm not going to get into too much of it because that's uh, that's Trent's area of expertise, but that'll be the culvert replacement and the, the, the road raise. Uh, purpose, uh, multifaceted, remove the trapped nutrients, uh, restore water flow, promote regression of non-native hybrid cattails. Um, the road being raised is to accommodate the new box culvert and uh, to provide flood mitigation uh, to the elevation that we saw during the flood and Trent's gonna talk more about that. Timeline is really, it, it's kind of dependent and he can uh, get I'll into, talk, I'll talk. yep, he'll talk about all of that for, uh, um, for his part. Phase three then is looking at the uh, revegetation. Um, we may see some flexibility, whether we do introduce wild rice first or native sedges, We'd like to work with Voyager's National Park, like to reach out to travel communities for advice and some guidance on suitability of the site, seed sources. We are working with Minnesota Native Landscapes on a, I believe it's a 26 species wetland uh, seed specific for our area. Um, and so the goal will be starting after the, the cattail removal that we would start a planting uh, fall, spring, fall, spring. And this grant goes, uh, it ends on June 30 of 25. So um, we have uh, some buffer. 25. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yay. And I'm gonna double check that. <laughs> Didn't we talk about that already? Yep. We talked about that. So uh, just an overview of the grant and where money's been allocated. Uh, the grant we applied for, uh, if it's under 400,000, it can go through the CPL or the Conservation Partner Legacy Grant. That's the small grants program that's administered through the DNR. Anything over 400,000 goes through the Lassard SAMS uh, big project pool. So this project right now has allocated the bulk of little over half of the money uh, for the cattail removal at 202 um, and that's with my built-in buffer uh, we've got 195 earmarked to support the road project and 2500 uh, to purchase the native seed mix there's our total 399 500 uh, from the state that does require a match um, and so we were looking locally to help support um, the match funds we, uh, a little bit from the property owners to purchase the wild rice. Um, the prescribed burn did not happen, and so that money uh, is not gonna be able to be counted. However, <laughs> I think the county is going to exceed its match portion uh, with the added work. So I put a little minimum there. That's the kind of the minimum that we needed to satisfy the grant match, um, but it's really going to be quite excessive um, so we will be more than satisfying that portion. And then the Soil and Water um, Conservation District, um, my staff support, my time, my staff's time, um, we're, we're donating all of that. So um, we'll capture that as a, kind of an in-kind support to the project as well. So in total, it'll be 465 between the match and the grant plus. And I'll just sit and 
Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, I'm Trent Nicholson. I'm the engineer. I'm terrible at uh, following presentations, but there are some cool pictures in here that you can look at. <laughs> so just out of curiosity, who lives on 134 or an offshoot of 134? Okay, just a couple of people. 135 in here. 135? Sure, sure, sure. So, like I said, I'm Trent Nicholson. County Highway. Uh, we are the road authority for, for all the county and UT roads throughout, uh, throughout the area. Uh, if you look at that first slide, is it up? I don't know. It is. And if you've got the handout, you can just take a peek at it. Yeah. So oh, this, you did handouts. Yep, yep, there's a whole bunch of handouts over there. <coughs> so this was actually when the road was being installed. <laughs> yeah, 1947, using a, uh, a drag line, I would assume. You can see the catwalk over on the, uh, the right-hand side or the east side of the, the roadway. But, you know, back in 1947, that's how they built roads. They just <laughs> mucked everything up from the, uh, from the bottom of the lake and basically caused a, uh, a big dam there. And we all know that the base of roads are very important. So why are we doing this project? Well, um, it, it, it does kind of come out of the 2007 project over on 194, the uh, installation of that box culvert. But it's also road condition based. It's also you know, the lack of water transfer. I call it water transfer. I don't know how much actual flow is gonna go through that, but there will be water transfer via wind or possibly even current. And then uh, the, the third one, and I don't want to make this a, a, a flood meeting by any means, but I'll talk about it a little bit, is the, the road surface elevation, of course. We all, we all know that. Uh, here's another picture taken right before the road was submerged, I believe May 18th. So originally, when we uh, when we met up with Soil and Water and the Rain Lake Property Owners Association, we were going to leave the elevation approximately the same, but we were going to put a series of arch culverts. That was our original and, proposal. Yeah, anywhere between five five to seven was the original design. We settled on five just for cost, um, but with the flood occurring. It gave us an opportunity to, to raise the road as well. The, 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 the DNR folks seem to be a lot more willing to work with us uh, for permitting this, so that's, that's, that's great. And we did see a, a change to our work plan. So we have an approved work plan under the grant. Um, so we met with Highway, they showed us their plans, and of course, uh, you know, it made sense given the flood needed to just all come through. So we submitted, um, I submitted those changes to the state for, um, for approval to our work plan, which was granted quite quickly. So they were in full support of the change uh, in direction and why. Yep. So next page, uh, what are we gonna, what are we gonna be installing? <laughs> I went one too far, sorry. All right. Well, the picture on this page is, uh, is from the peak, peak flood level, uh, June 14th, 2022. So the project that we're going to be doing is raising the road grade and installing a 10 by 16 box culvert. Uh, that 10 by 16 box culvert will be located approximately where the existing 36 inch corrugated metal pipe is. And at that location, we'll be raising the road grade about five feet. Um, as you travel to the south a little bit, our project limits, they kind of go up on land, oh, what is it, about 200 feet, I suppose, and we'll be able to see that in the next slide. But um, we maintain a level that keeps us about a foot, foot and a half above the the high water level that we saw in 2022 here. And just for clarification, that's 10 feet tall, 16 feet wide. Correct, 10 feet tall, 16 feet wide. So you will be able to get small watercraft through it for sure. Possibly if people are. 
willing to risk it, they can get a bigger boat. <laughs> there, maybe you can <laughs> go through there. Um, yeah, so the other part, of course, is uh, improving the road surface, making it safer. You know, the, we've got a lot of those causeway roads that they're not wide. I think that one has 10 foot lanes approximately right now. We're gonna widen them out to 11 feet. We're going to uh, um, increase the safe zone or the recovery zone. So if somebody slides off the shoulder or something, they're able to pull themselves back up without going into the bottom of the ditch or in the lake. Um, and then we're also putting larger shoulders on too. So larger shoulders, larger clear zone. And uh, yeah, like I said, the lowest portion of the road would now be 1114.5 based off the 1912 data. Yeah. So um, funding for the project, you know, we're gonna we're gonna siphon some of the funding off of uh, the CL CPL grant, but we're also gonna use our local option sales tax. I don't know if folks remember last year the highway department got a local option sales tax for our local county roads and UT roads. It's 0.5%, yeah. So we're gonna utilize those funds to do this project. Um, project currently, I put on here at 500,000. I'm thinking it's gonna be probably more in the $600,000 range. Um, the cost of everything has went up over, up over the past couple of years so much. In fact, uh, prior to even bidding this project, I went out and bought the box culprits. So I, I, I got them on order back in December, January, and they're expected to be here probably the end of August to the first part of September at the moment. We'll see. So not, are you talking about box culverts for the whole county or just because we're only getting one? Just, just this project. Is it, just just okay. this project. So this project encompasses 40 feet of box culvert. Okay, you knew and, at the end of the year that you were doing a bigger one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So this, this project encompasses 40 feet of box culvert with uh, um, two end sections. And three years ago, that would have been about 100,000, maybe 90,000. I purchased these for 190,000. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, you know, ideally, for this project, uh, best case scenario would be to put a bridge in, right? But bridges are even more expensive. Yes. <laughs> Can you see the end of the line? The timing again on that one? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the box culverts are expected to come end of August, first part of September. Okay. Yep. So project timing is, is talked about on the next uh, on the next slide. You're yeah, doing I got it back. 134 and 135 with box culverts? 135, when we do that, we'll have a box culvert in it as well. But not this summer? No, not this summer. Okay. No. 135, 135 is likely, you know, two, three years out, I would say. Okay. That's a bigger project because it, it's going to take a lot more material. Right. Uh, so you'd bring that level up also? We would, yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah, actually, the, the ultimate goal, so he, <laughs> You'll notice in the, in the funding discussion, FEMA isn't mentioned. <laughs> so originally I wanted to do mitigation with FEMA. I wanted to raise all the roads that were flooded up above, above uh, that uh, maximum flood elevation. And FEMA immediately said, absolutely not. We're not paying for mitigation. Okay, that's fine. Can we do a mitigation project but roll it into a like a resurfacing project. They like resurfacing. FEMA likes to see uh, you know, visual visual damage. They like to see roads washed out. They like to see culverts <laughs> culverts gone. That's 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 how they work. I you know I understand it. Um, so I was going down the road where I was going to do resurfacing and some base work, and then combine that with a with a grade raise mitigation project. So they would you know say they would fund twenty five percent of that or something. Uh, it got to the point with FEMA where they wanted us to do geotech work. You know, every, say, 250, 300 feet on these roads and basically prove that we have base issues, prove that, you know, we have one foot of class five or one foot of aggregate underneath the, uh, the asphalt and then prove the thickness of the asphalt. Well, that was going to cost the county 
hundreds of thousands of dollars, and there was no guarantee. So I, I backed out of that. But yeah, FEMA FEMA is not uh, not helping us with with any road improvements. Okay, project timing. So if you look at the picture there, that's kind of a uh, that's an aerial view looking down at the top, and then at the bottom, it's basically a cross section. No, sorry, not a cross section. A uh, elevation view or a plan view of the uh, of the roadway, and it's easier to look at the, the bigger prints. If, if anybody's curious, I can stay after, and we can, we can go through some of that. Uh, project timing: uh, I still have to secure some easements. Uh, we need two small easements on the south end of this project. I don't anticipate that they'll be difficult, and it's not much of a not much of a uh, hindrance to the property owner. I mean, it's we're, we're talking feet as opposed to like tens of feet. Uh, final bridge design, I'd like to get that approved by MnDOT, the MnDOT State Bridge Office. So box culverts are considered bridges. They, uh, they, they need to be approved. Permitting, <coughs> we still have to go through the permitting from the uh, Department of Natural Resources. However, like I said, they've, uh, they've been easy to work with so far on this project. So. We anticipate that that'll go fairly quickly. Uh, I mentioned box culvert supply chain, and then of course utilities. Um, you know, Minnesota Power, Frontier, uh, Midco, they all have uh, above ground lines running next to the project, and they're quite low. So they'll likely have to be moved up and over. And then the, the sewer line will also run beneath the project. Um, in our original estimate, it actually would have interfered a little bit with the box culvert. Uh, if it was uh, seven, seven and a half feet below natural grade. However, we had it located and it's uh, 12 and a half to 13 feet below natural grade. So we're, we're good there. So best case scenario, this is going to happen in the September <coughs> time frame of this year. Worst case scenario, we're looking at summer of 20, 2024. Probably not a bad thing to get to give residents a rest <laughs> of driving on a bad road, you know. Happy to have a road. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so accessibility during construction. This is always a uh, a, a point of contention with with folks, you know. It's, it's always nice when the project is done, but it's, it's a struggle when the project is going on. And we, we completely understand that. Uh, once this uh, commences, we're, we're assuming about a three week project. Um, we have two options. We can either run, we can try and run single lane traffic, where we work on one side and then try and do the other, or we can do a temporary bypass. Temporary bypass, adds cost. I think it would be in the range of about $100,000 and it also makes permitting a little bit more difficult because we, we have to fill the lake for a period of time. Um, so if, if we look at uh, single lane of traffic, it slows construction a bit. Uh, it doesn't stop the fact that there might be some full closures, you know, multiple hours at times. In, an, in the event of emergency, you know, we can get you from one side to the other, but uh, you know, there, there may be some inconvenience there for, for the folks. Um, those closures still could be, could be anticipated with uh, temporary bypass as well. Just moving the boxes, placing them. I don't know, uh, uh, they, they would probably use a, a large excavator to place these, these box culverts, so that's a little bit better than a crane. A little bit more mobile so they can get over the way. Tractor? Yeah. How much, um, if we go down a single lane or something like that, how much time will residents be given like advance notice? Or if there's going to be closures or something like that? The single lane's not that big of a deal. You can, you know, just wait. But if there's going to be closures going both ways, how much advance notice are we going to be given? Yeah, I would, I would write that into the contract. Um, I, I would say that the the property owners should be given at least a couple days notice okay. and you know 
the installation of box culverts is going to be the, the, the main right. issue. So they they have a good idea of when they're going to be doing that. So. Okay. So they're not going to be like coming out our door. Really yeah. 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 And I would have inspectors out there. I would be on site occasionally as well, making sure that uh, that, that that there's good public relations between the contractors, between the project and the, the residents. Uh, and then I think finally, so I had I had videos, I had videos at one point, but like, yeah, videos and presentations don't go don't go together real well. But I, for FEMA, I have driven the road at the max uh, water elevation with our lift and everything on there. And then in November, I drove it again so you could see the, the damage that was done to the road. Uh, but these, these two pictures just compare the peak elevation, approximate peak elevation to the November 8th, 2022 elevation. And one of the things, <laughs> One of the interesting things was, uh, so on the northwest quadrant of, of 134 there, there was a, like a little boathouse kind of at the, the edge of a rock there. We used that as kind of a gauge you know, to see how high the water level was. And when it was at the peak, the water was right at the, kind of right at the deck boards of that little, little boathouse or whatever it was. And then the water started to recede, and like, oh, that you know, that boathouse made it. Well, <laughs> we got some rain or something, and, and the entire side of the, uh, the the rock ledge slid out and took the boathouse. So that, was, that was a shame to see. I'm sure the owner felt the same way. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, any questions on the on the project on the road project? I'm not a cattail guy, but I can I can answer questions about gravel and asphalt. <laughs> no, it sounds good. It's uh, certainly impressed during our flood to get that road open. It was amazing. It was tough. It was it was really tough, and that 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 last lift was going to be the last lift that we were going to be able to put on. You know, we uh, we attempted to keep 135 open. But it just got so narrow and so soupy, we, we, we couldn't, I felt bad for the residents there. Um, you know, you talked about 135. Yeah. Putting a box collar in there, similar to that. Is that already purchased or no? No, no, no. That, that project is a couple of years old. We need, we're going to have to save up some of our local option sales tax money for that. And, uh, I guess my um, one question, you know, you got a little lifted and you come down 94 over that new box culvert right there. Yep. And before you get to 135, there's another culvert that's submerged there. Okay. Would that one be replaced too? On 95? 94. Oh, sorry, on 94? Yeah, before you get to 135, there's another culvert there that's okay. submerged. Okay. So the water don't flow very good through there. Sure. The, the beavers and all the other animals, you know. Yeah. It does have some flow. That one, you know, Place of, uh, okay. Yeah, I, I don't have any plans for that one at the moment. Uh, I guess I, I, I didn't know it was an issue, but I can certainly look at it. I mean, uh, my one thought is if you're going to raise 135, that'd be the time to take that one yep. out too and change that one. Sure, sure. So additionally, you know, we talked about 135, we talked about 134. 133 is programmed for a grade raise as well. Um, Likely not a box culvert at the moment, but I could be persuaded on that. <laughs> if somebody wanted to extend the, the channel that goes in front of uh, like Trent Steinbeck's there, and, and uh, I talked to Rainy Lake RV, and they're all for extending their um, channel that goes, that goes through their property you know, if, if funding were available. And then 94 is also programmed to be raised. So anywhere where there was gravel on the road before, we're going to be looking at bringing that up to in the next, in the next probably five years or so. Again, funding dependent. Yeah, we don't want to get in a situation where where we're where we're dealing with temporary raises and uh, you know 
potentially people can't get into their homes. Silver linings uh, were it not for the flood. Yeah, exactly. 135 would not be included in plans for, for culprits and box cuts. You know, got to look for silver linings. Right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should have floods more that's, right? that's a painful silver lining. Yeah, yeah it was. <laughs> or, it was a painful year. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any additional questions? Sounds real good. And then as you go farther down, 136, 137, both those would be programmed for grade raises at some point as well. Say that again, 136? 136, 136 and 137? Will be they, they're, they're programmed for grade raises at some point in the next, I'll say 10 years. Okay. Um, so 136, specifically the first mm -hmm. 2,000 feet or so of that road up till you get to uh, that hill that Grand Road lives on and then 137 there's actually multiple spots there that uh, that, that need to be addressed there have, have you looked at the other end of 136 also where it swings around and it heads toward the, the road it swings from going east it swings uh, to south toward the, the main road and that basically we, we live on 136 and both ends were about the same 103 so, yeah. yeah, you're, you're on 103. 103. Yep. We don't we don't have any plans to to nothing, raise that grade. Nothing at all. Not not not, not even at on moment. the entries from the main highway either way. No, no, no. So one 136 is uh, by Tilson Bay there. Yeah, we live used to live there. We moved up, I guess. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's we used right. to live there. We moved from there to 103. Yep. Yeah, with. With 103 being such a new road, and it uh, it did have water on it, but not to the same extent that some of the other roads have. You know, we were, we were looking at about six inches uh, versus yeah. versus multiple feet on on other roads. We might have driven through nine at one point. Sure. Time. Yeah. Yep. Nine or something. Hopefully, we'll see that. I know people were taking canoes into Hamlix yeah. or Root Park there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, was, uh, All right. it was a bad deal. One thing at a time. Huh? Got it. We're in good shape this year, though. Just as yeah. one addition on the FYI, the back of this wonderful booklet that Pam made includes all of our letters of support that we got uh, from. From the University of Minnesota, a cattail researcher there named Danny Schrank. The Rainy Lake Sports Fishing Club supported us. Voyager's National Park. Uh, uh, those were us very nice love. And, uh, and uh, uh, Rob Beckman as well. We, I'm told by Pam, uh, are the first, we're the first group to create a bibliography of scientific articles to support our grant application. And Jeff Cantor took our research and made an and uh, that we collected. He made an annotated bibliography. In other words, he summarizes it so you don't have to read the whole thing. The research and how it applied to our grant, and that's in the back of this book for the nerds in the, <laughs> the room. I think it's great. Uh, I don't get invited to parties anymore. <laughs> and I try to explain to Jeff that a public meeting is not what he thinks. It's like, it's I'm like, no, it's not. So, because it has been, I got a little excited, which means my phone rang a lot, uh, which is awesome. And I love that um, we were able to still follow through and really appreciate you guys coming tonight. Um, but it was just really important, I think, for all the partners to be able to be present and answer questions and make sure that, you know, folks understood why uh, this project was going on, what was going to happen. We appreciate, you know, Trent coming out. We've got our DNR partner here to answer some questions. If later on questions come up that maybe you didn't think of tonight, please feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, and if we're not the people to answer the question, all of our partners are available uh, and we'll get those answers and get back to you. If you happen to see Tom Carr's there too, tell him thank you for uh, his big ideas. Yeah.